currently, I'm trying to get this thing. It takes a while for it to share, huh? <laughs> currently in Africa, since 2019, you can see the numbers of innovation tech hubs that exist on the continent from north, south, east, west. This is a tremendous improvement. But is the situation changing fast enough? We require quick actions to keep up with the pace of technological knowledge, development, and innovation that will meet the needs of critical services for sustainable growth, development, well being, and prosperity. The situation requires a different perspective towards technological and scientific knowledge development and exchange. Quick action is critically important at this time. According to Christine Lagarde, president of the European Economic Bank and former head of the International Monetary Fund, the world is experiencing transformation on the move. What does this mean for us? We need to make change that will empower communities while the world is constantly disrupting due to technological innovation, social, environmental, economic change, and global pandemics. This change has to make it possible for communities to keep pace to secure a better standard of living, wealth, and prosperity. I reflected a bit on the INAT approach, embracing endogenous knowledge which offers, quote, a framework to link locally grounded knowledge with cutting edge science and technology, unquote. We're on the right track. This week, the conference offered the opportunity to share many creative approaches to meet the challenge and to look towards the fruit of active cross-pollination of innovation models. What do we need to consider to get to the community empowerment that we envision through this cross-pollination, technology exchange, and employment creation. I want to offer some ideas for consideration and debate in the appropriate technology community. First, the first one relates to the concept of technology and technology exchange in the context of appropriate technology. I'm not a specialist in this area, but I have had some experience experiential forays, forays, I should say, into the appropriate technology field in my early career. As a graduate student, I worked as an intern with volunteers for technical assistance in US-based appropriate technology NGO. Many of you might be familiar with VITA. VITA worked in developing countries to advance appropriate and small-scale intermediate technology for agriculture, food processing, small-scale, uh, hydropower, solar power, biogas generation, solar cookers, and the like. This was before the digital revolution. I also interned with a small hydropower project as well that installed this technology in developing countries. This was the 1980s. Let's fast forward 10 plus years to 1992. In Ghana, where I worked for the international US Agency for International Development, I knew individuals working with the burgeoning cell phone industry. They saw cell phones, like many in Africa and the developing world, as a way to leapfrog infrastructure development through cellular technology, although it was analog at the time, to deliver education and health services and to stimulate rural development. Let's fast forward almost 30 years to 2020. Have we seen the fruits of these promises at the scale the well being and prosperity levels that we envision. We are now living in a constantly disruptive world. And according to consulting firms like McKenzie and Company and others like Christine Lagarde, the key to transformation, the provision of services, and the adaptation of resilience, which we all need individually, at community level, national, et cetera and this continually disruptive changing world is digitalization. Now I want to explain the difference between digitization and digitalization. Some of you may know, but I will explain anyway. Digitization is the automation of a process or changing information from a physical form like a paper, information on paper to a digital form. 
Digitalization is the use of digital technologies to change a business model or to provide value. Value can be in the form of revenue or in other forms of value, according to the stakeholder, and to produce opportunities. How are we viewing appropriate technology, knowledge, and development in the context of digitalization? Are we looking to enhance the usefulness of endogenous knowledge and technology through digitalization and digital transformation, which brings added value? Are we using it to connect and to enhance exchange within local communities to encourage community learning and stimulate the refining application and diffusion of better services and products that we are looking for? What is the meaning of appropriate technology in the context of digitalization for well being in a more equitable society? These are just questions that I'm posing for us to think about. This brings us to my second question. The question of value for whom? As we work to improve the exchange and refinement of knowledge for improved products and services, we have to ask the question, will communities benefit through the innovation process of creating, delivering, and capturing value? The creative ideas or new ways of doing things are just one aspect of the innovation formula. New ideas are not innovations unless value is generated from these ideas. Innovation has a complete life cycle. This life cycle involves the exploration of new ideas, prototyping, refining, and scaling, and eventually full-blown distribution or commercialization of the product or service. This change is key to the innovation process because no one individual or community or organization, government or private, holds all the pieces of the innovation puzzle for technology or services. Innovation happens in a network or collective space where parties contribute and share and develop the technology, whether a product or service. This network or collective space stimulates the development of new ideas as this conference is highlighting. This network or collaborative space, or I'll call innovation ecosystem, involves a myriad of essential players, as we know, universities, research institutions, private companies, investors or venture capitalists, NGOs, foundations, facilitators, even mentors for innovation, startups and innovation hubs, as well as others who may take a specific interest in innovation. However, unless local communities are at the center or focus of value creation as participant users and creators and can capture directly the value and benefits created, this will not lead to empowerment. An essential aspect of this value creation is the form of value. The conference theme focuses on employment generation, but I believe one can bifurcate this aim to achieve greater impact through focusing on employment generation and business startups that receive the support to develop into full-fledged businesses within local communities. This bifurcated approach will help to create an enduring cycle of innovation, business development, and jobs created by these businesses. Entrepreneurial training at the community level is essential to this bifurcated approach, this two-part approach, and is an underlying theme of this conference. Ownership is a decisive factor in value creation, delivery, and capture from innovations emerging from endogenous knowledge. As local communities collaborate with many actors in knowledge exchange and product and service development, who owns the intellectual property? IP rights are a source of value creation and revenue generation for the individuals or collective communities who have historically transferred indigenous knowledge into valuable, commercially viable, and beneficial practices. A good example is the pharmaceutical industry that has benefited, and we all personally have benefited in terms of improved healthcare from knowledge on natural plants and traditional health practices. The global pharmaceutical industry in 1920, uh, excuse me, 2019 was worth $1.25 trillion. The Africa pharmaceutical industry is also growing 
So on a level of $5.5 billion around 2007 to $28.56 billion in 2017. And this is a great achievement for Africa, who has lost much of the value from indigenous traditional plant and health knowledge to external development and commercialization. However, how much do local communities benefit? As with the conservation of animal biodiversity, local communities need to benefit while participating in the preservation of plant diversity and the transfer of indigenous knowledge used through pharmaceuticals and natural medicines. The entrepreneurial and innovative spirit in Africa is alive and well. Many individuals or communities have developed creative and sustainable approaches to local and border problems. However, too many are not able to get the support to bring the new service or product through the full cycle of innovation. This cycle begins with intellectual property rights and then to prototype scale and capture the value. Local innovators need support. What kind of support? I have a friend who works with a development agency. He has been trying to create a supportive structure for local innovators with early versions of products and services. And these are young innovators in order to address development challenges, such as we are talking about at this conference. The concern was who would, who should own the patent, the IP rights for the new idea. The development agency would act as the financier and provide the connections to develop prototype and scale the new product or service. Should the development agency not own the IP rights to ensure continued societal benefits? Acting in the form of a venture capitalist, should not the development agency take a stake in the innovation and be bought out later as in the standard venture capitalist practice? Who was assuming the risk? Who would gain the value? These are very complicated questions. As an appropriate technology community, we have identified and embraced finding solutions to societal challenges and seeking societal good. But why cannot this also involve creating wealth and prosperity for individuals and communities? These questions can be very personal and involve public debate, involving economics, development approaches, politics, culture, and ideology. The actors in the appropriate technology and border innovation community will need to work out these questions among others if they are to achieve community empowerment. This brings me to the third issue of structure. The structure we employ to carry out this vision of community empowerment can facilitate, enable, empower, or weaken and disempower. Innovation occurs in an ecosystem which can be weak or strong, inclusive or non-inclusive, supportive or not supportive. Local communities require a platform to engage in knowledge exchange in this ecosystem and to collaborate in an innovation process on an equitable and co-creation basis. I wanna talk about an open innovation system as an approach to appropriate technology innovation and ideas for structure or platform to support local community participation. Many of you might already be familiar with open innovation, but this is generally how technology is developed. Henry Chesbro, who developed the concept, defined it as the use of purposive inflows and outflows of knowledge to accelerate internal innovation and expand the markets for external use of innovation, respectively. In the case of endogenous knowledge, internal innovation can refer to innovation and in the local communities. The open innovation approach enables the creation of networked communities focused on a particular problem or problems. The internet was developed in such a manner with a networked community approach involving many individuals and institutional researchers working from independent organizations in an open innovation platform. An open innovation approach to appropriate technology, knowledge exchange, and innovation would enable the social appropriation of knowledge in a structured way. Social appropriation of knowledge is an outward in knowledge flow. The social appropriation of knowledge is a process through which scientific and technological information is made known to the public or communities 
to use for their own social development. It can be considered equivalent to open source. Use of this information will require some facilitation and make it usable by local communities. But this approach empowers the community with information to determine how best to bring about local development, improvement, and well-being. Local communities also need a structure or platform to engage in an open innovations ecosystem. This platform could be created through projects and programs. Now, programs are multiple projects contributing to the same aim. Projects as a platform can be pooled to be useful instruments in the innovation cycle of exploring, learning, refining, and exploring new ideas for the network communities. Projects in their essence and at their best are diverse and inclusive systems of stakeholders. These project stakeholders work towards a particular aim through the deep processes, resources, timelines, and adherence to the product or services quality and usability. Local communities and their representatives or individuals can be participants, co-creators, and users of this innovation process through their network community projects. As co-creators, local communities would have legitimacy and be empowered to influence and shape knowledge exchange outcomes and the innovation process. Their participation would lead to adaptation of the innovation process to meet their very specific local context and local content needs best suited for local development. Through participation in these projects as a structured platform for engaging in the corporate technology open innovation system, the community could develop trust and reciprocity in the knowledge exchange and innovation process. A learning process through experiential learning would ensue from these projects. The local participants and partners can diffuse this project-led learning to create community learning to support future exchanges and innovation. So in conclusion, I have offered some questions and ideas for consideration. I am not an appropriate technology expert. I do not have the answers as individually none of us do. This is a multidisciplinary, multisectoral, multi-stakeholder challenge. Collectively, the challenge is surmountable, but action must be quick and forward thinking to keep up with the rapid transformation that is at hand. The conference team has communicated the desirable future for community empowerment through technology exchange, employment generation, and innovation cross fertilization. What I am proposing for consideration in sum is a review of certain aspects of the business model for appropriate technology and finding ways to bring the local community into the center of value and benefits creation, delivery, and capture. This introspection can lead to the continuous improvement of how we do business and create the basis for empowerment. Local communities and individuals through participatory project structures engaging in an AT open innovation platform can become co-creators and shapers of new technology for solving local development and societal problems. We can succeed at building the inward outward systems that privilege local innovation process, building on endogenous knowledge. Right now, I would like to leave you with words Trying to find this, okay, with words from written in actually 1957 by our illustrious ancestral leader, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, the first president of the Republic of Ghana and father of African independence. What other countries? have taken 300 years or more to achieve. A once dependent territory must try to accomplish in a generation if it is to survive. 
unless it is, as it were, jet propelled, it will lag behind and thus risk everything for which it has fought. Thank you so much, so much for allowing me to share my ideas with you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Keyes. This was uh, quite a profound um, presentation and you ended with the slide of one of my favorite heroes, uh, Kwame Krum. So, uh, <laughs> That's it. I want to open it for questions. I get uh, uh, you can enter your questions, uh, attendees, and we can and I'll have uh, Giovanni recognize those questions uh, as you do that. I, I think it was so essential that you were dealing with this whole idea of open innovation. Uh, it made me think of uh, uh, open source development as a as a computer scientist. And then also with regards to uh, the necessity to review this, this business model in terms of, of further engaging uh, the community. Uh, uh, maybe you could, while we're waiting for other questions, just say a bit about your engagement in some of, of your work here in, in Africa for us. Well, uh, interestingly enough, I've worked on the continent since 1985, Southern, East, West uh, Africa. I, I guess I consider Sudan East Africa. I worked in Sudan for three years and I've worked, I've worked in many places and I've seen the ingenuity of people. And I know the ideas are there. What is lacking is a supportive structure uh, in, in the ecosystem that will enable them to bring their ideas to full scale innovation. We have so many good ideas that don't get developed, that don't get prototyped, that don't do go the full cycle of innovation. And, and when it happens that someone at the community level comes up with an idea, oftentimes it can be that companies who might come in to support them actually eventually take away the idea and actually get the proper intellectual property rights. So the community is not really benefiting because they're not, the structure is not in place to enable them to have the support and the, the things that they need in an innovation ecosystem and to allow them to first think exchange and to have these networked kind of communities to develop stuff and for them to capture the knowledge. I mean, it's, it's a shame, but if you think about what I've said in terms of 1980, 80, 1990, 2020, we've kind of come full circle and we're still talking about the same things we talked about 40 years ago. So something, we need to do something differently. The business that's, model has to change. That's a, I think that's an excellent point in that, you know, you don't just repeat the same process and mistakes that you, you're making uh, and expect to see a change. Uh, Giovanni, do we have any questions in the Q&A box? Uh, we don't have any questions so far, Prof. Okay, again. Maybe I've hit people with too hard of questions. I, I think, actually, I think these are things we kind of have to go away and reflect on and the individual work that we do and then in concert with our colleagues and then when we talk with local communities. And, and try to understand from their perspective. Because the business model is not one from the local community perspective in terms of the value proposition and, and who is gaining, okay? Um, yes, society must gain. But if you, I did listen to Frere and Zamujo's presentation on Wednesday, and he made an excellent point. In fact, I worked with Frere and Zamujo and Benin back in 2000. Uh, two until 2000, actually 2000 until 2002, actually. And he makes an excellent point. We're not doing these things only to solve problems. We're doing these things to propel people into a state of well-being and prosperity, which will translate to well-being and prosperity for the continent. And I think 
historically, when we've looked at, at least from my experience in intermediate and corporate technology, it has not been about propelling people into a place of prosperity. It was basically about serving immediate needs. I think we need to look at it a little differently. Immediate needs, yes. If you look at the Maslow hierarchy, we want people to go beyond to be empowered to actually own the strategic resources that will enable them to continually innovate, create companies, businesses, based on that bringing together of knowledge, indigenous knowledge with modern science and technological knowledge that you're talking about at the conference. Thank you, that's so key. Good prof, there's a question Yes, there's a question from Marcel. Uh, it says, thank you for your presentation. The concept of development was mentioned and reminded me that uh, what I first heard from some of the INET members back at Howard in 2003, we are not underdeveloped, we are underfunded and wrong developed from, from Native America. Okay. That's more of a comment, uh, but yes, it is reflecting on the consistency uh, that we we have in terms of, of uh, our I network, uh, and and it certainly uh, there is underdevelopment as part of the the process that has taken place in terms of uh, colonial exploitation. Uh, and I think that it, there's certainly this issue with regards to uh, the insufficient funding. But I, I raise a question for you in terms of since you, since we talked about um, uh, the need for uh, a certain level of investment in terms of uh, of, um, of being able to develop. But here, you know, constantly in South Africa, they're talking about, well, we need this foreign direct investment. And this just sort of runs counter to my notion of being able to have community uh, empowerment. So uh, could you speak to that? And then I see another question coming up uh, after that. Okay, I didn't quite understand the question, though. He, uh, Dr. Uh, Trimble. Okay. Yeah, the, 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 the role, you know, they, here in South Africa, they've really been pushing the, the, the desire for foreign investment. And that kind of runs counter to my thinking in terms of empowering communities. So I just wanted to, to get your take on this, this role of foreign investment when it comes to empowerment and development. Okay. I think foreign direct investment can be helpful, but it depends on the platform, the structure in which you invite foreign direct investment to come in. If you haven't created the platform, the structure that enables communities or even the country to, on an equitable basis, negotiate with that foreign direct investment, then it's not going to uh, create the value, the welfare, the prosperity that you're looking for the local community. I think innovation cannot be closed. It has to be open the, the, around the world. Even if you look now what's happening with the coronavirus, this vaccine has been developed through open innovation. Okay, no one held to themselves the information, the knowledge is out there. And if you, I, I don't know if I should mention this, if you look at example, um, yeah, it, it's, it's the, the thing is, is to create the platform so that the knowledge that local communities have and the structure, to create the platform and the structure that would enable them to reap the value from that investment, okay? You, you can't really close because technology development is all over the world. I mean, if you look at how technology has been developed, it, it comes from different places. What makes it possible for countries, organizations, companies outside of this continent to reap the value of an open source innovation ecosystem is that they have the structures in place to be able to it grab the knowledge that is in the open innovation ecosystem and then to use it and develop internally. And I think that's what's missing from the formula. We, we haven't created the, the appropriate structures at different levels to enable us to benefit from that exchange, benefit from the farm resource coming in to be able to develop a 
inward, outward looking technology. Okay, we can't just be inward. <laughs> I think that's a good way of putting it. I see Marcel has, uh, I didn't see the full question yet. He says, from Native America, we had the concept of sumac kase. Can you provide more concept, comments on the development narrative? Oh, can you tell us what sumac kase means? Uh, can you put Marcel on as a panelist so he can explain that, okay. uh, Giovanni? All right, Prof. Just give me a second and do that now. Uh, uh, his audio so, uh, seems to, to be uh, completely off. I'm not able to put him as a panelist. Uh, well, maybe he could explain better in the chat what the concept is. I, I don't think I could under, uh, really respond to the question unless I understand what the I, concept I'll is. I'll try to unmute him, hopefully enough to, uh, yes. to answer. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, uh, please go ahead, Ms. Mosa. Okay, yeah, my apologies. I was in a computer that didn't have microphone. I was switching. Uh, thank okay. you for your presentation, Dr. Keys. Yes, um, my so Sumai Kausai uh, is a native concept that means the good life, and it has been used in, for example, Bolivia and Ecuador to substitute the development narrative uh, as, as the outcome for the government. So they don't want development, as they, they want good life as defined by the native people and so so my my question was about because i i think you said very interesting things uh, about development and so from your experience how can we challenge that narrative and you mentioned something already important the structure is very important right, of, of how that can uh, come but how can we change the development narrative that has been uh, brought by by imperialism and, and uh, colonialism uh, and turn it around for the purpose of of local empowerment that you mentioned that is, is so important thank you um i think it's a very good question because that's actually what we're in the midst of now with this pandemic a a, a major seismic shift in thinking in general about even the macro level of development and what is considered good life even, okay? But you're, 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 I think you've raised a very important point because different segments of the society have different ideas as to what well-being and prosperity is. But I also have to talk about that within the larger framework of sustainability. Uh, I cannot leave that out. But there are countries like Burma, for example, where they, is it Burma or is it, no, it's not Burma. What is the country in Asia and Central Asia and Malaya whose index of development is happiness? Anyone remember which country that is? It's not Burma. I'm trying to think which country yep. it is. Is it Burma? And I don't remember. I do remember the happiness index that they saw. Yes, it's a happiness index, which is very much a locally determined uh, indicator for development in the country. I think what needs to happen is, you know, as a society is, you know, we've always looked in terms of the macro international or global, and then development is always at the national level and determined in a downward structure. Okay. It's determined at the national level without clear participant participation and transparent participation and decision making concerning direction. Okay. And I think every place has to decide. I mean, South Africa has to decide. Um, and the communities in South Africa somehow have to be given an avenue, a way to speak to what is considered a good life. Now here, the question of good life, let's be honest, in many ways, the idea of a good life has really been determined by what we've seen globally. I mean, look at the television programs, the reality shows. That's the good life. And if that's what our people are seeing every day, maybe that's what they're thinking is the good life. I think also we also have to show people an alternative good life that is sustainable within the ecosystem in which we live. OK, and that's not happening in a very coherent way. There are different communities that are promoting this 
and trying to create information and creating an image of what could be a sustainable good life for everyone on the planet, not just a few, okay? But it also means changing what that image is, what, what that model is. And because right now, the models that are out there that people see may be models that they may decide are the good life, but they don't have all the information to understand because what was considered good life in a traditional sense, there are no model, there are very few models out there. They've kind of been overtaken by historical events and hegemony, et cetera. So I think as a world right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, the world is thinking about what does it mean to have a good life and a sustainable life, not just for us presently, but for our children, grandchildren, for the plants and animals that we hope will exist and that we won't be in the soy. I don't know if you know the movie Soy Ain't Green. No, I haven't. Okay, yeah. I'll, I'll just mention it because I'm a movie fan. In Soy Ain't Green, there's a part in the movie, it's a society where all natural plant life and animal life has really been destroyed through some sort of a catastrophe. And when people die, they go to a technological center where they choose the view they want to see as they're dying. Do they want to see a bubbling brook? Or do they want to see deer leaping across an open field? Or do they want to be in a tropical forest and see parrots, etc.? I mean, that's not the life we're looking towards. <laughs> so I think it's now important for communities to redefine and also their options to let them know what options are as well. I don't know if that answers the questions. I don't have the answers because all of us together have the answers, but only if we're looking at it from a perspective that takes into consideration that we have a global population and a planet where everyone has a right to have a good life that is able to be, that is able to happen in a sustainable way for everybody, not just for some. Thank you, thank you. I see that Tori has her hand up. Uh, can you recognize, can you uh, activate Tori's mic so she can speak? Giovanni? Yeah, uh, yes, done. Hey, Tori. Tori, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Dr. Keys. Thank you so much for this presentation. It was wonderful. Um, have you ever considered, I mean, have they considered looking at the different innovative ideals that come out and you know taking it into a, a structure you mentioned structure but a structure as far as um utilizing a project manager to actually take the ideal from concept to completion and just running that through you know the system that we use is, is agile what's called an agile project management um skill set where you can accomplish twice the work in half the time and I've, I've been able to help so many different um, communities complete a project and an ideal that they've come up with just by um, running it through a, a I developed a model called the change brokers from the agile mo methodology just by running it through that system and it just requires you know that that focus effort you need a team with focused effort and, you know, and put it into a structure uh, using, you know, tools that we use in Agile um, to accomplish the goal. Have you considered, um, you know, just assigning a project manager to someone who has an innovative ideal, ideal and forming a team to just work it out? Okay, those are very good ideas. I don't specifically work with the organization at this point that where I would be in a position to assign someone. But what you're speaking to is the whole structure of a platform that would enable local communities to engage in an open innovation system, okay? And if you use, and the thing is project management itself is people think of projects in only maybe one way, but the fact is the skills of managing a project are applicable to so many things. And project management is very important and projects for the whole innovation cycle of exploring and exploiting. And that is essentially coming up with ideas, exploring the value, the whole idea of prototyping and scaling, and the exploiting is actually going to market, okay? 
It's, it's actually carrying it out and getting the value out. And so this is very much part of what can be included in a structured platform of uh, connected, uh, collected communities that work on a specific problem to use the whole project framework and the project management approach to managing the whole innovation cycle from exploration to exploitation that would enable communities to actually get the value. As long as the focus stays on the community or the individual at the community level, they're at the center and are co-creators, co-shapers. Because you could bring a project manager in and run it from the idea to the market. The question is, where is the community? Where is that local individual who helped to develop that product if they're not at the focus and they're not ones who are going to directly benefit from and own that strategic resource because they become strategic resources for the community. And then the community itself has to develop and, and determine how to use this. It could be on an individual person basis, running companies, or it could be collectives, cooperatives, or whatever. But the possibility for innovation at the lower level, at the, the local level, is so great in connecting it to regional, national, you know, international, the, 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 I believe personally, the possibilities are limitless in terms of the technology that can come out of the continent. Absolutely, thank you. And it's very um, interesting that you say the community because in the um, change broker methodology that I've created, um, basically if there's an ideal, we call that a change opportunity. And then you form a community around that change opportunity. And the community will consist of the person who actually comes up with the ideal. And then those people who can help um, be the think tank to bring that ideal to fruition. And from the community, they form teams called crews. And those, those are the boots on the ground. Those are the people who are actually going to implement the, um, the task or the, um, the different what I call crops <laughs> in that I, I take it all the way back or agricultural. Um, they implement the work that the community has um, established needs to be accomplished within a given cycle. And then they report back to the community what's been accomplished. And then from that on, I mean, they keep iterating through that until you know you realize the change opportunity. And so you're right to form those communities. And that was the idea that I had behind it is that the people on local levels are involved in whatever the change opportunity is going to affect their community, that they're actually um, engaged. And there's no um, hierarchical leadership in this, and that I've, I formed a concept called J-centric leadership, where um, you can consider it as a, a, a circle. And depending on who has the expertise at the time um, for whatever you're working on, that's who that dial um, circular or would point to to actually lead up that operation if it's a financial thing and you have a financial planner on on board then they will actually um uh, give the you know the the different um steps that need to be accomplished in order to succeed and everybody rallies around them and help them you know pu push that through so um it's absolutely necessary it can be done um you just have to focus in and have some kind of a strategy. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? And, and, oh, go ahead. And many things people will always say, well, we, we don't have the funds. I sometimes attend the uh, Congressional Black Caucus meetings here in the U.S. And I remember they were like, well, we're waiting for Congress to approve this and approve that. And in the back of my mind, I think I did stand up and say, whatever happened to sweat equity? <laughs> Why are we waiting for people to fund us on everything? We're never going to get anything done, right? <laughs> yeah, but, but Tori, you, you, two things I want to say. The last thing you said is very important because someone else also asked about funding. Okay, this is the donor mentality. Okay, where if we're to do anything, it has to be funded by somebody else. Right. And there's so many people around who would be willing to invest in what they see are potentially profitable ideas that can come out of the local community. And it's a, and this is a part of the creating the appropriate technology open innovation platform is bringing those investors in 
the guy who and who came up with the code for Impressa. I'm sorry to have to say this. You know Impressa? No. Impressa is the money exchange, money transfer. Uh, it's digital that is really made it big in Africa and Asia. In fact, he's not part of the company. He was not part of the prototyping and scaling. He has nothing to do with it, okay? But I think, and that, that thing with the scale, and it's, and it's known as one of the great projects, innovative projects on the continent, and it is. But the issue we're getting at is these, you know, our young people have great ideas, but the ecosystem to support it is not there. The platform from which they can then engage with other communities collectively to develop the technology, the structure is not there. And what I find about what you said, Tori, also, and you're laying out your process, is I could see very clearly that there's an experiential learning process that goes from that group. You said the, the change opportunity group to the crews who are on the ground and the reporting back to the community, okay? Because as they report back, people will pick up on that knowledge and it also will stimulate other people in the community to get involved. So uh, congratulations on that. I, I, that's very interesting. In fact, I'd like to hear more if you, if you could comment. And, that and absolutely, um, Lynn, the, um, the, the supporter or the person that you mentioned who was in a press, uh, um, I think I got it. They would be considered in my model, a champion. They do not have to be a part of the community, but they're who we identify as a champion. Those people who have resources, who want to contribute to the cause. And you know, any you can select, you can identify the champions um, for that particular change opportunity. And when you're laying out, you know, laying out the, um, the structure, but those people are considered champions and you're absolutely right. They don't necessarily have to be involved in the day-to-day -day work or in the planning, but they just want to support it. and that model is, I mean, that's a portion of the model that I have. Yeah, there's one um, uh, idea that is kind of come out of, I think, East Africa, a young woman, I think Kenya, who came up with the system to actually draw water from the atmosphere in arid communities to create mm -hmm. water, water, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, dispensers in schools. Now, this is a small technology, but I'm wondering, she's doing it in schools, but if she were in a, a, a networked community, this project platform within an open innovation system, if she could enter in that and then connect with other people who can then help to enrich, further develop, refine her idea to be able to really prototype and scale this thing. And you know, we have so many Arab communities on the continent worldwide. I mean, just the potential for that. And I know there are investors around who would be interested, but the structure is not there. We need to focus on our business model and get the right structures in place that actually will bring value back to the community and have them at the center of the innovation process with the external experts in science and technology. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have that. Uh, Giovanni is going to read out, but Lynn, we definitely uh, need to engage you with our develop further development of our web portal because it sounds like a lot of what you're doing there fits right into uh, the concept of expanding uh, into appropriate technology web portal that covers the kind of concepts you were mentioning. Giovanni, could you read the question, please? Yes, uh, thanks, for Krimble. Uh, the first question I, I have here comes from uh, uh, Gada Kadoda. Uh, they're asking uh, Dr. Lin, how do we deal with the contradictions of African scholar? Uh, it says they deal self-connected to Western nations of what science is and the science they know exists in their old self. So how do we deal with the, 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 the that's a contradiction of the African scholar? Well, that's a very interesting question. It's very hard for me <laughs> to answer, um, though I consider myself. And I mean, one of the things I'm working with in terms of I won't look at it, uh, if I can come at the question in a slightly different way. One of the things I'm looking at in trying to develop project management capabilities, et cetera, on the continent 
is really focusing on the inside out. We cannot live in isolation. And it's true, we've lived under the knowledge hegemony of the West, okay? You can't just throw out that science and technology, okay? But what you need to bring is an in, inward, outward focus, okay? Outward focus, inward, outward focus, which then you, you start to pay attention on building your local capacity to be able to engage on an equitable basis with the external uh, uh, scientific, academic community, et cetera. Because we can't do anything in isolation. They didn't do anything in isolation. In fact, <laughs> Western civilization is built on Africa. I'm sorry, that's my personal opinion, okay? But <laughs> it's the, the science, the technology largely is built on other societies, but that is the basis for technology development. This technology exchange, in some cases, has been appropriation. All right, but what we we're in a situation now where we can actually look at how do we develop the capacity to take our knowledge and meet external knowledge creators, brokers, etc., on an equitable basis, where when we come together we are creating something that enhances both our lives. I don't, I, I'm not one for an isolationist approach, but I think we have to look in in order to perform outwardly and to develop the inner capacity to be able to do it uh, on a credible basis. Because some of the, actually my own personal experience in listening to people, when you talk about systems in Africa, even in projects, in Africa, even when I was doing my research, if you talked about doing, looking at a project in Africa and looking at it in terms of best practices, et cetera, people would kind of say, what, what? Because the assumption is it can't be best practices if it's in Africa, right? So our focus is on, you know, developing our own internal credibility with each other and building the institutions that enable us to interact and contribute knowledge to the global ecosystem. To contribute knowledge on an equal basis to the global ecosystem. That only can happen by an internal outward focus. I hope that gives you some idea. Thank you, thank you. You have one more question, uh, I think, there, Giovanni? Yes, Prof. Uh... We've got one more question from, uh, from Leon Pina. Uh, they're asking, uh, the ideas of the, the open source community is very powerful and even extend from IT into architecture or CNC production like the Open Desk and uh, WikiHouse initiatives that is published on this IT resource for all to develop and change to the local cultural Involvement. I think that that's more more of a comment. Uh, let me maybe ask uh, last last question. Uh, it's coming from uh, from Gada Kadoda again. It's, uh, no, sorry for Leon. Leon again. He says, should the platform not be universities, for example, the GIMP open source software versus Photoshop that was developed at the University of California? That's from uh, Leon again. Okay, should the university, the, you're asking if the university should be the platform. Yes, they're asking should the platform not be universities, for example, the, G, the, the, the GIMP open source software versus uh, the Photoshop that was developed at the University for California. Okay. okay, now the university, now we're talking about community empowerment, are we not? Now universities are players in the ecosystem. What we're talking about is creating a platform for local communities to be players on an equitable basis. So what does that say? There should be a platform to enable communities to interact with universities and all the other players. Now, it's not to say that the universities would not be facilitators on the platform, that collective community platform, that project with the local community, okay? Because they were facilitators and mentors. 
But once the platform itself is the university, that changes the total focus. I'm not saying the university is not a player, but it changes the focus. You need to come up, from my personal opinion, with the structure that places the focus on the value of the ideas coming from the community, which that structure enables them to engage with other science and technology people to help them to develop the idea that they have. So I don't think the platform should be owned by the university. It, it, this is a question to work out. There are all kinds of ways to work this out. But my focus is on making community members equal players, co-creators, co-shapers, and owners of the strategic resource that's being developed for this, uh, that's this innovation. Uh, thank you. I see one last question here from Jumbe. It says, you shared an, uh, a quote, an Nkrumah quote that he would have made nearly 70 years ago. You mentioned the types of structures we need to actually enable communities to achieve what he stated. But, but what's standing in the way? What do we need to remove those obstacles? Wow. This is what I'm posing. I don't have the answers. It's a collective response. That's something the appropriate technology community, I invite you to do humbly, is to consider the questions and things that I've raised and think about them, reflect on them, look at your business model, look at the way you're operating and answer the questions for yourself and say, can we do this differently? So that the focus of value creation is really on the local community, but not with the idea that, I mean, it's, you want, the value to come out of there. You want the community to be powered through their creating, delivering, and capturing the value. But you also want to have the larger impact on the nation. But it's a collective impact that is like, what do you call it, compounded interest. <laughs> it's not just a collection of innovations that happen around the country and around the continent. But every innovation is a, is a basis for another innovation. Because when the ideas are out there in an open kind of source uh, ecosystem, other people can pick up on it and be stimulated to create something else. So I think it's something we all have to go back and think about to say, how do we make this happen? The answer won't come from one place. It will come from collective ideas. I think that's so well put in terms of the Focusing on the collective, I, I want to again uh, uh, thank uh, you, Lynn, for this wonderful presentation. I think it it fits right into our next phase in terms of looking at the way forward, uh, because you've challenged us basically to to contribute to the solutions. You know, you raised questions, and even the last question that was raised to you, you put it right back in our plate, saying that you're an organization that's addressing appropriate technology. Please, you know, humbly, as you say, <laughs> address it. And I think that is our challenge. And this leads us right into our, our next session uh, where I'm going to present some slides in terms of what has happened during the course of the week and pose for the audience, for INAT, for potential new members of INAT, uh, for those that are just here for the uh, Appropriate Technology Conference, uh, how we see possibly the way forward. So I want to again thank, we'll give a, a visual clap for our, our keynote presenter, uh, Dr. Lynn Keyes. Thank you again. And we will continue to be in contact with you and, and hopefully you will continue to work with our network. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I guess you would relinquish the share and then uh, Giovanni can turn it over to me and I can uh, put up the slides. Okay.
So I want to thank everybody. We are uh, now going into, uh, I guess, our home stretch here. And this is a traditional part that we have for uh, our conference in terms of looking at basically planning the way forward. So I'm going to put this in presentation mode. Giovanni, can you hear me? Yes, both can hear you. You are very clear, both. Okay. Okay, so the three things I'm going to look at is one, the outcomes from uh, the work this week, not just the workshops, but the, uh, the PhD colloquium and and comment briefly on the keynotes that we had before today, and then briefly talk about our membership and the 10th ICAT. Uh, starting with the first day, we had our PhD colloquium. And the interesting point, this was the first time we included this in our ICAT conference. And I certainly hope it becomes an ongoing feature. We had the opportunity because this was based on ongoing work that uh, Prof. Muchi had been doing. Uh, it had based on ongoing work from Prof. Prof. Muchi that uh, he was able to draw from speakers that he had been working with in, in previous colloquiums in Africa, the USA, Europe, and Australia. So he was also uh, able to, to get uh, participations from, uh, from a wide range of people that were not just enrolled in our conference. So this was one of the uh, best attended individual events within the conference. And we definitely look to plan for this in our future conferences. We had to plan a simulation game, which is a project that is uh, ongoing here as part of Merceda and the the, uh, the, uh, the Ditsela TUT partnership headed by Prof. and Pofu. And there, 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 the interesting thing was that we've done this game before, but it's now being used more for online uh, audience and participation, and it had this international flavor to it. We had the two-day appropriate technology and medium-scale farming workshop, and this was an exciting venture uh, that engaged uh, practitioners in East Africa, West Africa, uh, and Southern Africa, and was headed by our, our uh, one of our founding INET members, uh, Brian Stevenson, who was there in Benin. It highlighted the Songhai Center uh, under uh, Dr. Fa Father uh, Godfrey Nzamomo Mojo, who also spoke as a keynote, but it really highlighted this as an example of Echo Agricultural vi uh, Village that was a, was a feature in uh, a number of uh, the workshops and comments. The Open Building and Appropriate Technology Workshop, this was a special session conceptualized and moderated by Professor Amira Osman, who is here at TUT with us, and Professor Gia Bizi, who is in Hong Kong. She had uh, uh, 38 six participants from all over the world, in, in, in addition to Africa, Singapore, Belgium, Japan, and Israel. And all of the uh, presentations are going to be available on YouTube, which we will share with you. And the panel itself of uh, uh, 10. Hong Kong, China, the U.S., U.K., Brazil, uh, Egypt, the Netherlands. So you see this variety that exists in even Cyprus. So uh, we want to have our, our, our hats off to our own Professor Mira Osmond for uh, the wonderful job she did with this. And hopefully this will be an ongoing feature of our ICATS. Uh, next, we had the socially relevant research uh, workshop uh, where myself and Prof. Muchi uh, presented. Uh, and there we, uh, we concluded there needs to be more focus on agriculture, agribusiness, such as what goes on at the Sungai Center, and that there needs to be a decentralization of energy systems, uh, which will lead to decentralization of power, both in the sense of the material sense of power, but also in terms of political. An interesting concept was raised in terms of clean energy having the meaning of both clean energy in a material sense, but also clean from corruption and imperialism. We must motivate 
for more R&D support in Africa was one of the things that we would say. And this R&D support should be along the lines of socially relevant research and development. And we must also at the same time address the, the fact that we have inherited colonial structures uh, that need to either be vastly changed or just totally replaced. The Ethics and uh, AT Manifesto workshop, which was designed to lead us toward uh, a, 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 an AT uh, Manifesto, uh, once again, inf the participants emphasized the Songhai model as, a, as an eco agro village uh, and how it needs to be spread across the global south and that when we deal with ethics, we have to deal with the practice of it. Uh, there needs to be more partnership among African universities in Africa and the diaspora. And one of our participants even referred to the uh, diaspora African universities, Africana universities. Many uh, institutions address aspects of, uh, of INET's AT declaration and their vision and in their ethics principles and that this needs to be captured and related to and linked to the last item in terms of development of a manifesto, which also uh, takes into account the S SDGs. The Women's Business Matters Workshop engaged women from across Africa and the diaspora, and one of the outcomes was to assign mentors to women just starting with their business venture. And also uh, one of the members of that also had entry in the tech fair that was quite exciting that we referred to. And they agreed to continue on as a, a, as a unit uh, beyond that ninth ICAT. So this was important and that we're trying to build ongoing uh, networks and they were successful in terms of agreeing to do that. Uh, the virtual reality programming workshop uh, exposed uh, a, an international audience to the unreal uh, programming development environment in terms of how to approach uh, developing virtual reality programs. It was successful in identifying international collaboration possibilities between uh, TUT and Howard University, which also uses Unreal. And they also identified possible funding uh, through Unreal, which would, could lead to a possible further development by our, our people here at TUT. Uh, the Raspberry Pi workshop reported that they had eight uh, online participants and they briefly covered the history of Raspberry Pi and why it's a good platform for prototyping physical computing projects. Uh, and it went on to have demonstrations using some hardware simulation libraries and then ended with discussing the environmental and social consequences of the electronic industry and how to think about appropriateness. The computing projects in that context. So it got into one of the areas that I know Jumbe and I initially started working in, and we started working with INET dealing with uh, socially relevant computing. The Techathon, which was also uh, coordinated by Jumbe Po, uh, they had three uh, Techathon meetings this week in terms of uh, uh, getting students to uh, to, to meet each other on the different teams and to discuss the possible projects. He indicated that it was slow in terms of forming teams with this fully virtual nature of the event and the requirement that teams be cross institution. Uh, so that is proving to be a little harder in terms of teams than if you were obviously in person. The way forward is to clarify all teams and identify their projects so that we can be proceeding on schedule uh, so that they can complete that by January and have the session be scheduled for early January where projects are presented and uh, judges uh, uh, evaluate the projects and make the uh, awards that we designated. The Indigenous Knowledge Systems Workshop, which was yesterday at four, looked at the Indigenous Knowledge System uh, was linked to public health. In this case, we had panelists from South Africa, the Sudan, and the USA. It also addressed knowledge systems and even the impact that knowledge of these indigenous systems have with regards to tourism. And once again, it highlighted the importance to agriculture, and in this case, the significance of the agro, eco agro model at the Songhai Center. So we see at several of our workshops that 
having people who were engaged before with uh, Father Godfrey, having participated in the initial two-day workshop or hearing his keynote speech, I uh, found that uh, this was a key example in terms of, of, of not only indigenous approach, but more broadly how we should look at appropriate technology. So the last session we had this morning on innovation for liberation in Africa, we had uh, three panelists and uh, 15 participants. Uh, with there, we linked appropriate technology, activism, and the need for Pan-Africanism. We reflected the thoughts of Mahmoud Sharif, and who wrote the book, The University That Opens on the Street. And we leak contributions of Africans historically from Africa and the diaspora to te technology that focused on a man and woman's must in terms of uh, in terms of needs, meeting meeting needs. Our keynote speakers uh, uh, have have been we've had six keynote speakers over the course of this week, and all I think all of them uh, have done a, a really good job. And we've, and we've ended here with Dr. Lynn Keyes, who we just finished listening to, uh, who I think has made it clear that we it's on us to move the, the ball forward. Uh, a lot of questions that were raised uh, in this last session, I think, direct back to us to what we have to do in terms of moving INET forward. We had started off the week with uh, Joseph Madal and our Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research, uh, Dr. Papu uh, and in the first day, it's sort of opening it up for us. Uh, I think did excellent out uh, some of, of, of the developments that she's engaged with. And as we mentioned, Father Godfrey in Samojo uh, is instrumental in the, uh, in the range of work he's doing with, uh, with uh, the Songhai Center that is not just the initial one that we visited at our last conference, but exist in a range of countries in a range of different formats. So I uh, want to thank all of our, our keynote speakers. We had the special student sessions, which ended uh, just uh, uh, this morning. Um, and this was headed by uh, our Dr. Adenuga, who's part of our organizing team, who had identified two students, Zolani and Giovanni, uh, to head those sessions. and. Uh, it engaged students in really trying to define and understand better appropriate technology. And, and, they, and they found, the students found these sessions both informative and thought provoking uh, because they came from a range of backgrounds in terms of understanding appropriate technology. They discussed the work in China and saw this as a possible benchmark in terms of how to move forward with appropriate technology. And they also expressed the desire to continue work in this appropriate technology arena. Uh, so they can advance many of the ideas that they heard and that they presented. We had the poster session, uh, which was a two-hour session conceptualized and moderated by Prof. Osman and Dr. Danyan. Uh, they had a panel of experts that uh, reviewed the posters and, and served as a, a sounding board of asking questions of the presenters. They were 10 largely student, but some professional posters from across South Africa. And you'll see that they are available uh, in a spatial chat room, which is the same room that we, a uh, platform that we use uh, for the tech fair. And the tech fair, the next item that I have here, we had 10 projects that were displayed uh, for, uh, representing different countries and institutions. And we're able to have this tech fair open 24 seven from Tuesday on through today. And we'll have it open uh, at, for a while after the conference for those in other time zones. Uh, however, we found that we we did we didn't get the same the the number of engagements in the tech fair that we would have wanted to. Uh, and maybe this is something we can address in the future in terms of of how to increase that audience. But it did open a relationship uh, with the number of startups that were able to. Uh, to display their work at the tech fair and allow them the ability to network through the course of, of this conference. So that's a, a summary of uh, where we where we've done so far in terms of of this week. So something it uh, before I move to the membership drive. 
I wanted to see if uh, any of my uh, INAT cohorts wanted to add to uh, to the comments in terms of that that summary in terms of, of of not trying to capture everything that we've done, but if there are other points that they I uh, think should be raised in terms of of decisions made in terms of of moving forward in terms of that. So uh, I'll start by uh, asking if uh, if Prof. Osman, who is our local chair, uh, wanted to add any points uh, to this. Giovanni, can you open her mic? Yes, Prof. Fandana. Osman, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Thank, Thank you. you so much to Prof. Trimble for that um, excellent overview. Thanks to our keynote speaker. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and Prof. Trimble, I think you covered everything except, and forgive me if I missed it, except for the academic paper process and the book. Um, uh, that's, right. the, yes, you're right. In fact, I was going to ask you to comment on that uh, but that's a good point that leads right into that because you really coordinated and i think uh, prof osman did an excellent job and it was a lot of hard work but can you just sort of you know give us give the audience a summary of that process and where we are now uh, because i guess it's online even okay so the the book is is published uh the ninth icat uh book is published uh, we followed the Department of Higher Education and Training, the South African Department of Higher Education and Training requirements for accredited publications. Everything was uh, done based on a strict a double blind peer review process. Um, we had a very large panel of reviewers. We acknowledge them. The process would not have been possible without them. And um, we also uh, edited all of the papers. So the authors worked with us very closely um, in, in, in developing the papers, addressing the reviewer comments, and then with, uh, addressing the language um, editing process. And thanks to the editors who are uh, Prof Trimble, myself, uh, Brian, and Gada. Thank you so much. The book is available online. I, I, I really think uh, there, there are so many people that I would love to thank in this process, but Jumbe has been amazing with regards to the work that he's done on the website. So I just want to acknowledge him and I hope he's listening. And um, the book is available on the INAT website and it is also available uh, on Scribed. Um, so yes, thank you to all the authors. Uh, we um really appreciate the effort you made thank you oh yes we have uh, we have you. close we have close to 80 papers i think it's 79 papers that were ultimately published and i think we had something like 170 abstract submissions so from that we ended up with about 80 papers that are published Thank you for all the hard, hard work, and I also second your, your comment on the good, on the wonderful work that uh, Jumbe had done in terms of really kind of keeping pace with all of these. Could you say just a, a, a few words about Scribe? I don't think many people realize the significance of, of that. Okay, so it means it's uh, accessible to to everyone. Um, internationally it's a it's a, a, a platform where you can download books and documents so i i think it's re it just makes it accessible to a much broader audience so if someone searches for um appropriate technology on scribe they will find it it's a little bit like kindle um so i think it's really great that we have it there because that's uh, it is a platform where i often go to look for books or search for keywords so it just gives uh, the appropriate technology book uh, and the network a much wider um, exposure, if I can put it that way. Yeah, that's what I was getting. <laughs> Thank you, Prof. Osman. And I think it's a, 
is a, is a new one for us. Not only is this uh, significantly uh, uh, um, a significant advance in terms of our rigor with it, because uh, uh, Prof. Osmond is being modest about all of the work that she put into this. We went through not only the double blind peer review process, but then we went through, uh, uh, the four of us editors went through everything, and then Prof. Osmond went back through it, and then we went out, sent everything out to the English editors, and then came back from the English editors back to uh, the authors to make sure that everything was in line, and then out to the designer that she works very closely with before we ended up with the final product. So we have really uh, gone the extra mile, and particularly Prof. Osmond, I commend you and and, the, and all of the work that you've done, and I think it'll show uh, not only in what we have today, but even as people reflect and, and, and uh, get access to this, it'll reflect on not only your work, but it'll, it'll say a lot for INET in, in general. So I think people need to realize that. Uh, uh, Giovanni, are there any hands in terms of others that would like to comment on, uh, on, on the report? I don't see any uh, hand. I uh, only see a Tory, which I think is the odd one, but I see June bears a, a hand up now. And also for okay. as well as a hand up. So okay, please, please uh, turn it over to the, to to them one at a time. Okay. Jumbe, uh, please uh, go ahead with your question. Jumbe. Oh, it, it's not a it's not a question. I just wanted to um, add a uh, a little bit of color around the techathon as well because I'm I'm excited about a few possibilities that can come out of this. Um, especially as we look forward uh, in engaging um, more of the next generation of producers uh, in appropriate technology work. Right now we have students participating from um, uh, several places, from, from the US, from Zimbabwe, from Sudan, from South Africa, Russia, Puerto Rico. Um, and I think there's something I'm forgetting. Uh, but these students are, like John Trimble said, their next step is to um, form teams. And the teams that they're forming must be uh, with someone from a different institution. So that likely means from a different region. Uh, and that's something that uh, I think I'm particularly excited about and um, excited to see the fruits of their uh, cross-pollinating ideas. But that's all I wanted to, to add in. Thank you. Okay, Prof. Pofo, please go ahead with your comment as well. Uh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Uh, I also want to take this opportunity to thank everybody who has participated in the arrangements of the conference. Um, I think I was a member of uh, all the structures, but I think maybe a, a bit of a limping member. But uh, I think the event has been a great success and it has uh, profiled uh, our young Department of Industrial Engineering uh, globally. And I think uh, we want to congratulate uh, Prof. Pro Osman and uh, the, the, the co-chair, Professor Popola, and uh, of course, Prof. Pimble, and, and, and all the, the people who participated. Uh, I just wanted to get a sense of the issue of uh, publishing the, the videos as recorded during the, 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 the sessions. Uh, is a strategy being determined or one is still to be determined? That's the first question. And then the other one is uh, the question around um, the, 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 the indigenous knowledge systems. Uh, there's a conversation that needs to be taken forward there. And uh, we had asked the technical team to capture the email address of the people who express willingness to uh, participate in the next steps. So, 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 um, it would be great just to get a sense and give a sense to the rest of the participants on maybe the 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 the, the way we will be proceeding going forward in that regard. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. Uh, in regards to the last one, we have uh, the email list of everyone that not only attended but that registered for for that workshop that we can use as the basis of, of, of what you what you mentioned there. Because okay, Prof, uh, also Dr. 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 sorry. 
Prof? I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to finish commenting on Prof and Pofu's statement, oh, okay. and then so, we can go sorry. to the next one. All right. Yeah, that, so the other comment was in regards to the recordings. What I hope we can do is just as you now have the program, you can go to and you click on it and you go to uh, to, to WebEx room or to the tech, uh, uh, to, to uh, where the tech fair is, I hope we can then basically embed the links to the different uh, recordings so that someone can actually then uh, get that that they can basically go to the program after the conference and click on on uh, for instance Father uh, Godfrey's keynote speech click on him and they could actually get the, the recording from that speech so that's what I envision that we'll be able to do I'll work with uh, uh, um, Jumbe and to see it I, I think that should be pretty straightforward uh, now, then you go on to the next question. Uh, is that uh, Dr. Dr. Duran will also to give a comment as well, so I'm, I'm going to unmute him as well. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. Duran. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Prof. Trimble and Prof. Osman. I just wanted to uh, to make a, a quick comment. I, I've been in touch with Professor Muchi, who has been involved in this conference, and he's the editor-in-chief of the African Journal of Science, Technology, Innovation, and Development. And together with him and uh, Prof. Trimble, uh, look on the INAT website. We'll probably issue a call um, for papers on endogenous knowledge and appropriate technology. Uh, and so uh, look out for that. Uh, it's open to everyone who participated in this conference and in previous conferences. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Duran. That's a, a, a good point that we had discussed earlier. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, not only our INET members, but others who participate in the conference will follow up on, on, on that call for papers. Are there any other comments? Yeah, just the a, a last comment uh, on the chat box from uh, Gada Kadoda. Uh, they're saying, uh, I think we all all the entire on-site team a big round of applause for the superb job and uh, successfully uh, pulling the online event. Uh, a special thanks to Jumbe and of course to John and his leadership. That's from uh, Gada Kadoda. And that's all from uh, the chat box. Yes. Uh, thank you. I want to before um, I go to the next point in terms of uh, membership drive, I, I did want to uh, pass on a sadder note. Many of you know that uh, Dr. Yoni, which is one of our founding members of INET, passed uh, away uh, just last week. Uh, and um, that's with, with sorrow that I passed that information on. We, we shared that information in our network, and I'm trying to uh, contact to see uh, how we can pass on our condolences to his family there, uh, in, both in his family there in Zimbabwe and the UK. Uh, but uh, as we know, life is finite, and this is uh, one of the, the reasons it's important in terms of INET uh, thriving. We move membership uh, and, and this is is a, the point of us actually expanding and growing uh, is that we have to 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 replicate ourselves uh, we have a membership form online uh, uh, that's at our website and we're also sending uh, a membership form to all of our uh, our registered uh, participants so uh, that uh, a link rather to it. So we're encouraging uh, people to do this. So we had and we actually had distributed earlier within uh, ICAP. And some people already have uh, had submitted uh, forms. And I just wanted to let you know that by uh, next starting next month we'll be responding to that. Uh, the the process this is part of our bylaws is that. Uh, we just ask someone to fill the form out. They are basically agreeing that they uh, follow our appropriate technology declaration. 
and they agreed to work with one of the committees. We are not a dues-based organization, we're a work-based organization. Uh, and we have, as, as earlier this year, uh, been registered as, an, uh, 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 as a nonprofit uh, based out of uh, Maryland in the U.S., but it is international nonprofit, so our membership is international. So you will see uh, more from us, and, and hopefully everyone uh, will be on board of helping us grow. Uh, so I want to, to thank you and to, uh, to just add that bit about that. Uh, we're planning uh, to, once we uh, uh, deal with responses in terms of the membership and how the, the membership form works is you uh, will basically uh, indicate uh, one to three of the founding members who will serve as, as sponsors for you. For you. And on the list, all the founding members, you just check those off and we'll send your membership form to them. And then they'll basically we'll, uh, hopefully <laughs> ratify that. And then we will, you know, uh, send back a notice to you. So um, that's the process. Um, are, are there any questions on that? Uh, or any others of our INET founding members online want to add to uh, this? a whole effort in terms of our membership grant. Um, can I just say something? Yes. Yeah, this is Dr. Mateka Imano from Newcastle University. So firstly, I would like to uh, thank um, Professor Popo. We met last year and I based at TUT, I think a year on, uh, we have had uh, the opportunity to uh, allow me to participate in the um, ICAT, and it's been a great pleasure to make, um, submit a paper. Um, uh, now, there is a question uh, that arose when you look at the membership form, which talks about um, someone sponsoring you or some one of the um, founding members. So somebody had a question, but now they've left. The question they had was they I, they just had the opportunity to present a paper, but they don't know like people who are like found finding members, so they can't have like a sponsor. How do you deal with that? Where well, someone is interested in membership, however, they cannot identify a sponsor or somebody they know who is part of the founding members. Thank you. Uh, that's well. We have on that form the founding members listed, so uh, it, so that's that was part of the reason we have them listed. We are not relying on someone to know who the founding members are. So if they didn't know any and they just checked off the, uh, some, like for instance, they may have heard me speak at the conference and checked me off. Then it, then I will review the application, even if it's someone I don't know, and if I. If questions I can then contact uh, the applicant. So that's the idea. We're not trying to restrict it to to all only people who know who I know. <laughs> so that that's how we're trying to address that by including the list of founding members and not restricting that you have to to know them personally in order to uh, ask for a recommendation. But all in right, the form, you know, it does indicate you know, why you want to join, and that the and it, and it has some basic information on, on on you know what you do. So that would be the basis of one of the founding members uh, making a recommendation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, do do we, are there other hands? I saw Hattie's na name flashing. Did she have a her hand up for questions? I, thought, I just thought that maybe someone in the audience may be curious um the leadership okay i think you asked about the uh, whether someone might be curious about the leadership and right now we uh, the board of we have a board of five members of myself uh hattie carwell kadena uh, uh, John Therrican and Jesse Bimley, and I'm uh, the current president, uh, Addie's vice president, and uh, Jesse is the treasurer, and Kadena is currently the secretary. And, and one of the things we'll do is at, we'll have a general membership meeting 
after uh, we sort out all the new members, and that will probably be uh, the first part of next year. It'll be online. Are there other questions about membership? Okay. Um, I don't see any other takes hand me to, Okay, that takes me to my last slide. Usually uh, at our, our current uh, appropriate technology conference, we address the planning for the next one. Uh, in some occasions, we've actually, when we've all been in the same location, people have gone around and lobbied for the, hosting the next conference. Uh, uh, that's not a reality with us online. Uh, but what we also uh, do is we compose a planning committee. Those of you who, who uh, have gone to uh, the application for membership, you'll notice that one of the standing committees is the conference planning committee. And I noticed that several people did check that box off in terms of application. So uh, that's one of, uh, uh, of the of, of the things we'll have to do. And as we get new members in, we will uh, compose the planning committee, both of our, our current members and new members. And the task then is regarding is the selection of location. So in, in lieu of not, at, at, when we have not decided at a, uh, at a ICAT where the next location is going to be, we send out invitations to host ICAT. So we will come out, uh, uh, the, the, probably next month is, and we'll send it out to all of the uh, participants, is an opportunity to uh, in, to organize to host our next ICAT. And it's not limited to people who uh, are, are have come to this conference or previous conferences. It's an open invitation that we also post on our website and people can share with others that they think may be interested. Uh, then um, we receive the applications uh, from, to host and we review them and, and make a decision uh, as uh, uh, the INET organization in terms of where we'll host the next conference. So uh, I have not heard any, uh, at this point, any uh, suggestions or rumors as to who wanted to or where we want to host it. I guess a lot of this depends on where we are with COVID and, and hopefully two years from now, we'll be able to meet face to face uh, and have a, a lot of lively discussions uh, at lunch and, and at dinner and in the evening uh, or over a cup of coffee or a beer uh, and not just have to do this virtually. Um, so uh, that's where we are. Are there any comments, questions, uh, uh, other comments from our INAC members on this process? Yeah, is there anything on the in the chat room, uh, Giovanni? Uh, no, Prof, there's nothing on the chat box. But I see uh, Jumbe's hand up. I don't know if it's an old or a new hand. Uh, let me just unmute him and ask him to speak if he has any. Uh, even no, I'm so sorry. I, I just neglected like to put it down. Oh, okay. And I also see Marcel's hand is also up. Is there a new hand, Mr. Marcel? Yes. Um, good, okay. good afternoon. Um, just a quick comment um, on something that could uh, go along these lines. Uh, I'm thinking for in two years uh, to work with some team in East Africa to see if we can be hosted in that uh, region. But uh, we'll, I hope we can discuss that uh, maybe at the beginning of 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we've, uh, we've in the past, uh, I, I did give a little history of where we've been with the conference. We've been to the first two in Zimbabwe, then the third one in, uh, in Rwanda and East Africa, and then uh, the fourth one in Ghana. Uh, uh, the, the fifth one then came back to uh, South Africa, and then, I, then we went to Kenya, and then to uh, back to, to Vic Falls and, and then 
and then the Benin and back in terms of West Africa and then uh, and now here. So that's the history of the first nine. And certainly, you know, going back to East Africa could be an option. Uh, and we, we really want to explore all of those options and, and, and see what the membership wants. Okay. Um, I this last comment uh, from Gada. Uh, they say that my internet is not good, but uh, I would like to suggest that we add an interactive component to the website since we are looking towards growing the membership and posting various opportunities. That's from Gada Kadoda. Yes, I think that, uh, that I think that that's something that we have to work with. Uh, Jumbe is getting more and more added to his plate. We really need to. One of the things we need to do is look at really in in uh, getting him assistance. So hopefully, some of uh, the new uh, members will have some IT skills that can help us with actually enhancing. Uh, the website to be interactive, to be that kind of portal that we want. And I know Agata has some skills too and has some people there that have worked on our, our, our website in the past. So that's something I think we need to definitely follow up in terms of following up on Agata's suggestion. Um, are there other uh, comments? I, uh, I think that's all we had as comment, Prof. There's no more other comments. Okay, um, we were to have a closing statement at this point from uh, Prof. Munda, our Dean for uh, Engineering in the Built Environment at TUC, TUT, but I don't see him. And I know there was an issue with the meeting that uh, for the niche areas that he had to attend. Um, do, uh, do either you, Prof. Osman, or Prof. Mpofu have any idea? as to whether he's coming or or was tied up in that meeting um, sorry i have no idea but i know that it was isaac that was following up with him I, he sent me a message early this week saying that he had not been able to participate earlier, but he was looking forward to it. But then I, I, I haven't, that was like two days ago. So I, I haven't heard and he's usually uh, pretty much on it. So I'm thinking that he's probably sitting right now in a meeting with the DBC and uh, cannot pull yeah. away. Yeah. So um, I, I in, in lieu of that, uh, uh, Prof. Osman, would you like to make any closing comments? Uh, I, I really have to say I appreciate uh, working with you. You are a very hard worker and uh, meticulous about a number of things. And I know we had certain points we were interrupting each other and may, may even have gotten on each other's nerves a little bit, but I think it was well worth it. At least I appreciate your efforts in, in working with you. Thank you so much, Prof. Munda. Um, sorry, you were talking about Prof. Munda. <laughs> Prof. Munda is not here. Thank you so much, Prof. Trimble. Um, I really have appreciated this opportunity. I think I said it to you um, and uh, the group this morning that this, uh, you know, first of all, it was just a conference and it was a lot of hard work. But by the end of this week, I had really bought into uh, everything that INAT stands for. And I'm very much inspired uh, by um, the, you know, the, this movement that you're promoting. And I'm very much on board and it has been a, a real honor to get to know you, to work with you. Um, and I, really appreciate your leadership and thanks to the whole team um, i'll be thanking people individually i don't want to miss any names so i'll be sending messages I, i've driven some of you crazy i know uh, i hope i'm already forgiven <laughs> so 
Um, but it was a real honor, an absolute honor to know this network um, nationally and internationally. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Professor Osman. Uh, I, I know we also had great help from our assistant chair, uh, Prof. Papula, who I think had to pull away, uh, and certainly from uh, our team, our international team. Uh, Marcel is on the line, who's part of that team, and Hattie, Agata, and, and Duran are all part of our international effort, uh, and, and as well as uh, Prof. Uh, Impofu. Um, and our, our student assistants uh, have been have been wonderful. Uh, Chulu has been very helpful in terms of sorting out a lot of administrative things from the invoicing to uh, uh, to getting the finance officer to to keep our account open, which normally you know the university's accounts have to be closed uh, early in November, but we got special permission to straight from the uh, the CFO who has been uh, immediately signing a lot of the paperwork to deal with everything from uh, getting the spatial chat cover to covering uh, us being able to uh, give some of these student assistants minor stipends for the work that they've been doing uh, during the course of this. So this is a, a special shout out and thanks to Chulu for all of, all of that. And, and the work is not over. We uh, are planning to follow through with a lot of the, the video and the recording that we've gotten now and want to put together, uh, not only uh, pass on the links to the sessions like this that can just be dropped right into uh, into the, the program to show, reflect what actually went on, but the plan is to take a lot of the footage and to, to reduce that to, to more uh, digestible segments uh, the capture of uh, the key points, and we uh, are, are working with uh, one of our, our local people here who has been videoing different segments here, and we'll be taking a lot of that footage and, and coming up with uh, a visual uh, video version of, that will fit into the report. We have uh, Dr. Adenuga and Dr. Danyan that have been uh, positioned to follow up in terms of putting together the follow-up report. Uh, we encourage everyone to to go online and, and click on the assessment form. That's only part of what we'll be doing in the report. Uh, but we also have an external team of, of several people who uh, are not part of INET that we've asked to be an external evaluation team uh, that will, will assist us in this evaluation process. So we hopefully will have a comprehensive reporting process to report back when we hold our, our INET meeting at the first part of the year with our, our, our new membership. So uh, on this point, I, I want to thank everybody for participating, for uh, playing uh, both working roles and leadership roles in, in this conference. I think we've uh, been successful with it. And uh, with that note, I, I want to, to end today's session and, and this week's conference. Thank you, everybody. Prof. Can I please ask everybody to turn the video on just for last uh, screenshot photo as a memory, please, if you don't mind. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. See what for the other people to turn their videos as well. Yeah, it's coming up. Okay, a few more is coming out now. Let's wait for them to come. I think Thank you. some of us cannot turn on, at least I don't know how to. Uh, okay, that's fine. Okay, we can say I can't uh, 2020 chase to everybody. Let's, let's smile to the picture, please. Let's keep a smile on <laughs> for, for a few seconds. Okay, Ale, thanks guys, thanks everyone. There we go. All right, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Giovanni, for part of our documentation. Okay, Prof, no problem.
So everybody uh, enjoy uh, the rest of the, uh, uh, I guess the weekend now. Uh, uh, and I guess many of you on the other side may just be starting your day off, but uh, we're winding down here. Thank you. Okay, thanks.